Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I am proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Our theme for this year is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedicine, where we enjoy presentations on Fridays from leading thinkers about the promise opportunities and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for a culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held here in historic Charlottesville, Virginia in June. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Sean Baez from Michigan State University, where I learned today that he has been for 11 years. And he is an associate professor and the director of the Michigan State University Center for Bioethics and Social Justice. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in 2005 from St. John's College and MA from Indiana University in Bloomington in 2008 and his PhD at Indiana University at Bloomington in 2010. He is a philosopher of health, focusing on evidentiary and ethical complexities of how social contexts shapes health. He is the author of the 2018 book, Philosophy of Population Health, Philosophy for a New Public Health Era, um, that he um, uh, was uh, also had a, a, a co, sorry, he is also a co-editor with Will Kukla of the Oxford University book series, Bioethics for Social Justice. In continuing our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series theme, Sean's lecture today is entitled Interdisciplinarity in the Health Sciences and the Pursuit of Health Equity. In Sean's presentation today, he will remind us that health equity has been one of the most widely endorsed goals of health science research. At the same time, interdisciplinarity has been widely endorsed as a means of enriching health science research. But Sean will point out that the relationships between these two proposals is not always that clear. His presentation will describe how the interdisciplinarity framework of population health science offers a coherent account of how interdisciplinarity can, interdisciplinarity can directly serve the goals of health equity with humanity and humility serving as the key connecting concept. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching via YouTube, thank you so much for joining us today. And also our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are strongly encouraged to submit any questions for Sean via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and I will ask them during the discussion period uh, of our presentation today, the last 10 minutes or so of the hour. And with that, Sean, welcome and thank you so much for providing us with your thoughts and your vision and your experience. We've been really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I, um, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be invited. It's, a, it's, a, it's of course an honor. And um, uh, I really appreciate how, uh, how amazingly well organized this whole this whole show is. Um, it's uh, it's been a pleasure working with the uh, with the folks behind the scene here, um, and so um, so so thank you for uh, for sure making this um, not only possible but also easy. Um, it seems like nothing is easy now. Um, so uh, yeah, the, uh, I guess the the sort of the, the the snapshot view of this has already been given. So I think I will jump right into this on this relationship between interdisciplinarity and health equity in the health sciences. So uh, I'm gonna sort of give you two, two sides of a coin. So on the one hand, for an individual patient, um, their risk for heart disease, for cancer, for innumerable other sort of health outcomes um, is gonna be attributable to a bunch of different factors, often interacting. And a lot of those are going to be genetic or congenital or, or otherwise sort of hard to, um, hard to change for the individual. You can sort of deal with the, you can deal with the hand you got dealt to you by, um, by life. Um, but it's very hard short of uh, things like, you know, like gene therapy, which are sort of coming onto the horizon to actually change some of those, some of those things to actually change the hand that you were given. Um, and in that same vein, clinical medicine um, has made such a, some really amazing advances 
towards doing things like improving um i just uh, as an example here's um uh, cancer death rates they they sort of been going up for for, for many 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 years and then then in the 1990s they started actually declining um which is really an amazing it's an amazing accomplishment in the in the arena of sort of dealing with those individual risk factors especially um so uh, and this is this is historically sort of where I where I did a lot of my sort of early early work was sort of like looking at these like what are these sort of risk factors how do we think about them that kind of stuff I I, I have a doctoral minor in genetics um, and so I was I was working on sort of like um, how we sort of conceptualize um, genetic evidence and medical genetics so that's on one hand on the other hand there are massive between population differences that are pretty obviously not genetic or congenital or otherwise sort of um it's just the way that or an unchangeable or a very difficult to change aspect of the hand that you're dealt so um so as an example this is a i thought i would sort of use the, the university of virginia you know i'm not sure where people are uh, geographically but you know um this is a super high resolution look at lo local life expectancy patterns using data from up through 2015 um, there's often a lag with this kind of stuff, and so um, this kind of this kind of granularity of data isn't available to almost anywhere in the world. The, the U.S. has some, um, is uh, is relatively sophisticated with our data collection on this kind of thing, and so these are basically at at birth. Like, what's your life expectancy if you live in this little micro neighborhood? Um, it's, it's actually using a, a census um, designated areas. So, what I did here is I cross referenced those those years in that map with the life expectancies of countries that have that have almost have identical or nearly identical life expectancies to give you a sense of the way in which we can we can be living geographically next to somebody or to or next to a population and in some sense we're also living worlds apart um or at least in terms of this the scale of the differences so so for instance i grew up on a sort of like on the edge of a health cliff in um in uh partially in um in sort of suburban boston and if I if I traveled two blocks east of me, then I would uh, uh, the life expectancy would go down on just shy of eleven years, and so that's that's actually not atypical. And so you know you have you have sections around University of Virginia where people are living um, 80, oh, 87.1 years, which is higher than the highest of uh, of life expectancies for any country, and you know just a few miles away you have people living um seven you know, less than 74 years so this is sort of this the scale of differences that we're that we're sort of talking about because i i i do this in a lot of my talks because i think there's there's a it's easy to underestimate how big of the differences i'm talking about here um uh or to or to, to also get a sense of um of some of the international scope um the u.s is a is an outlier among among high income nations where we have um our life expectancy, chronic disease rate, sort of like almost every health measure, we're sort of we're we're well behind or very 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 far behind most other wealthy nations. And so, uh, our life expectancy peaked in 2014. We've never made it to 79 years as a country on average. Um, and for instance, Spain got there in the year 2000. Um, I something I sort of uh, I can sometimes press on, maybe even a little too hard when I'm talking to folks who are working inside um, inside biomedical sciences, because I think the um, there's uh it's easy to assume that that more technology will sort of sort of bias more health um and often it can in some ways like you know those those declining uh those declining cancer mortality rates a lot of that has to do with the the um, basically the, the kind of nih centered work that that y'all are doing but at the same time you know spain was able to to get better was able to achieve our highest level at the same time as the as the, the invention of the of the ipod um let alone the iphone like way before that so um so this is the kind of the, so i want to sort of uh, i want to point out this this is sort of like the scope of what we're talking about here in terms of between population differences so we're talking about equity there's nothing about this that's okay i can't imagine an, an ethical system under which it is cool that there is this these enormous 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 differences between populations that have really no justification or reason that i can see it. it it doesn't have to be this way i'll come back to that so um so one way of sort of cashing out this difference is um what uh what the epidemiologist and um, sort of population health thinker um prevention preventive medicine thinker um jeffrey rose said is the difference between the causes of cases and the causes of incidents 
Um, so this is something that, um, I'll, again, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, do, I'll delve farther into this and in talking about um, population health theory um, in just a little bit. But um, there, there are just basically two different types of causes and effects we can sort of look at in the world. So it's um, so one way of sort of talking about this dis distinction between the causes of, of um, uh, causes of cases versus causes of incidents is take something like U.S. heart disease risks. So the causes of an individual person getting heart disease or not are attributable to a huge number of different things, and a lot of them are going to be genetic factors or other congenital factors like um, like a developmental the developmental patterns that you're sort of just born with, and so. My family, so personally, my family history, my genetic, my genetic lineage, all that kind of stuff, that all comes into play in my likelihood of having a heart attack or not in the next ten years. So, the, so the so the difference between whether I get a case of heart disease or if the person next to me does, those differences are going to be to to a large extent um, genetic, unchangeable, that kind of thing. At the same time, there are massive differences between on between on average. Heart disease, um, heart disease outcomes for Black Americans and for White Americans, and also for uh, also for uh, for Hispanic Americans like me. And so, the th the thing is, though, there are these big differences between populations between Black Americans and White Americans, for instance. There's a massive amount of research on that, and there are differences between individuals. The thing that people sometimes mis um, mistake is assuming that it's it's for the same reasons. And so the difference, differences between me and another person and our, our, uh, another person standing next to me, our differences in heart disease risk might be, might be due largely or even predominantly to, to genetic factors. But when there's, when there's actually been uh, focused research looking at are any of the known genetic factors that cause, that, that are known to be, uh, that are known to have play a causal role in, in heart disease risks, are any of those accounting for those between race differences? And uh, Kaufman et al. have some, has some really cool research they did in 2015. This, this has been backed up in a million other studies in a million other ways. Um, that no, there is no overlap. And so we have between population disparities, we have between individual disparities, and they're just not they're not attributable to the same stuff. So we have um, so we have this really annoying problem that we need to sort of ask different questions about why is this patient getting sick as opposed to why is this population getting sick? Um, and so they are, they are both important questions, but they are not the same question. So <clears throat> what we're left with in the case of something like, uh, like, uh, like racial health disparities, or um, I, sometimes I, uh, I, I really prefer to use the term racist health disparities for, for the reasons I'm about to lay out in a moment. Um, it's almost always going to be that these outcomes that we're worried about, and so, um, so, so going back to health equity, that they're attributable to a racist racial climate structured around race concepts, not because of actual genetic differences between um, racially identified populations. And so, if you want to talk afterwards about like what is the, the what is sort of the state of knowledge about but average differences between different populations and their, their genetic makeup, makeup or whatever. The short version is no races are not biological concepts. This are hold up according to modern science. They were, they were racist 18th or 17th century concepts that sort of stuck around for a long time. And we, we sort of will these differences into existence. And so you have massive, massive effects like um, that American Indian and Alaska natives, um, uh, native populations live. Um, this is uh, even before, the pandemic where things got weirder, 5.5 um, uh, uh, years on average, less than the US average. That's a massive difference. And then people will sometimes say like, oh, well, there's that thing, but aren't there also differences between, isn't sickle cell anemia partially racially patterned or isn't this stuff about lactose tolerance and different genetic diseases? And there's some interesting data on asthma rates somehow being attributed partially to, partially related to, um, to ancestry. like. Yeah, yes, probably some of that is true, but um, it's really important to recognize that those are essentially going to be rounding errors within a massive, massive, massive uh, uh, exception where you have huge, huge differences. And based on everything we know about any possible genetic factors that would be contributing to that, it's going to be at most a rounding error. And some of that might not even hold up over time. So... <clears throat> So when I talk about um, a society structured by racism or it's, or, uh, it's, um, or other sort of formulations of, white, of that, 
Um, the, the kind of framework I want to I want to sort of propose to people for sort of thinking about the range of ways that we can sort of think about the um, the causal structure of the problem of racially inequitable health outcomes. Um, this one comes from Kamara Kamara Phyllis Jones, who is the former president of the American Public Health Association, and she divides it into into sort of three different um, sort of like zones. And so you can have a, a racial climate, a racist racial climate that negatively impacts health outcomes through three different sort of uh, three different modalities. So you have personally mediated, which is sort of the one that people sort of talk about the most when they talk about racism is sort of the interpersonal relations in one way or another. And so you can have uh, a doctor treats their black patients differently in a way that is, that is negatively impacting them. And so there's all sorts of research on the way that that happens. It's a, it's horrible. And I try to deal with that as someone who works inside a medical school. Um, it can also lead to things where um, uh, there's a there's a big new branch of research right now on um, on the, the role of stress response. And so um, uh, it's, uh, there's what's called the, the weathering hypothesis that seems to have hold, held up pretty well so far, which essentially says that the um, these the chronic stresses of, of interpersonal racism, or even just the experience of sort of having having all eyes on you when you walk into a store, people walking to watching to see if you're going to be going, expecting you're going to be shoplifting. Um, this sort of this this negative sense of being sort of discriminated against and sort of being scrutinized um, negatively really takes a it takes a physical toll on the body that can be measured, and so it's um it, it wears you down, um, and uh, it causes elevated elevated stress stress hormones that take that basically takes wear and tear on your body, and it causes negative health outcomes. So so there's a lot of different so it can be sort of like just negative negative treatment interpersonally in sort of like the obvious way, but it can also be sort of the uh, the accumulated effects of other people sort of like having these little microaggressions and negative negative impacts on you over time. Um, there's also institutionalized racism, um, which is something that we are sort of like gradually starting to talk about more as a country, which like good. Um, so things like differences in, in, um, in socioeconomic status, I'll, uh, I can sort of uh, address a little bit more of that later. Um, access to healthcare, there are big gaps in terms of um, average wealth average access to healthcare. I can sort of get 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 into the numbers, but it's uh, it's really quite horrifying. And at the same time, there's also um, there's also the, the phenomenon of internalized uh, racism, which is something that that um, it makes a lot of people un uncomfortable to talk about. Um, but it can it can do things like um, basically people from from marginalized populations. Like so I'll take the example of of me. So I'm I'm a I'm a Chicano Hispanic Mexican American. Um, and so, so there, so there are people in my community who are sort of like who become sort of nihilistic about about their um, about their health prospects, and so you sort of learn to, to to accept the the lot that you've been given by life. And so it's like, oh well, well, um, people like us, we just get diabetes, and there's nothing we can really do about that. Um, it's uh, it's just sort of like it's a uh, it's a, a certain fatalism about it, and it ends up with the same sort of negative impact as if you have schools set up to sort of very, very subtly tell, tell, um, tell girls as they're growing up that girls don't do well in math, then they start sort of playing a social role of not doing as well in math. And so it's the same kind of, it's the same kind of thing where you start internalizing these negative messages because it's sort of, the world is sort of like telling you these messages again and again and again. And eventually people start to believe in that's, that's really horrifying. So all three of these uh, simultaneously and sometimes interacting will lead to negative health outcomes. And so that's a lot of different uh, mediums of, of negative impact. And at the same time, um, so it's not just not just in terms of wealth, there's also there's also um, what's called the wealth health gradient. Um, this is the this is the graph I think about every year when it comes time to, to, to find out whether I'm going to get a raise or not. So this is a graph of life expectancy. Again, life expectancy is a it's a it's a good sort of shorthand for looking at sort of like overall health outcomes. Um, based on your percentile of income. And so for every percentile of income that you go up, so does generally your your odds of living another year. Um, so this is this is life expectancy for 40 year olds. And so um, so I'll, I'll be turning 40 in a matter of months. And I'm sort of wondering like, where am I gonna end up on this on this graph when I get there? Like if, if I get that raise, maybe I'll be farther on this end than on this end. And I would like to see my daughter grow up and things like that. And so it's um, uh, the 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 point here is that um, other countries have have gradients like this too. Um, the U.S. is relatively unique in having ours is really steep. 
um, this is these are really big differences between just like a single percentile of income. So the the one percent and the and the very very bottom percent oh, are uh, are in very vastly different experiences. So <clears throat> so what's the what's sort of the the theoretical takeaway that some people have been getting from this? Well, the idea is that very broadly, and there are different sort of theoretical lenses for looking at this, is this idea that we that that effectively promoting health, trying to make it better, is going to require action across the whole of society. So if if our if our racial health disparities are are as a result of socioeconomic status and also interpersonal relations inside the clinic, and also the the accumulated stresses of living inside living inside neighborhoods where you're being negatively scrutinized. And also it's the the sort of like the the, the insidious development of negative views about one's own body and one's own behavior. If it's all of that kind of stuff, just, just in the example of, of racial health health outcomes, then what we need is we we need action across the entirety of society. To deal with this kind of stuff, and so this sometimes goes under the under the label of health in all policies, which is um, which is in, um, a both a descriptive claim and also a sort of call to action. And so it is saying whether you like it or not, tax policies, for instance, are health policies because whether or not you have an extra thousand dollars a year could decide whether or not you live to the next year. Um, uh, and on the other hand, or at the same time, it is also a call to action saying that we need to have health in all policies. We need to be advancing health with our policies, because if we do not recognize that our our decisions about where to put a new highway are going to impact whether or not people are going to be breathing in pollution, whether they're going to have access to to travel to work, whether they're going to be displaced by, by the building of a new highway, all of that impacts health. And so we should start dealing with this. And so this is an idea that's been that's been advanced by the CDC and um, the American Public Health Association and lots of other people. So it's just sort of out there. Um, so surrounding this, or, or sort of like underneath this, is the the, the development of this theory or this. Um, it's a it, it's an interdisciplinary movement. It's a branch of interdisciplinary science. It's a, a theoretical framework. It's sort of all these things at the same time. And it goes under the name of population health or population health science, sometimes population health framework. And so the person I mentioned before, Jeffrey Rose, came up with that distinction between the causes of between person dis disparities and between population disparities. He was a, a hugely influential figure, but the field sort of got off the ground initially in the, uh, with this 1994 volume by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, where they very aptly titled their, this, this, um, this edited volume saying, why are some people healthy and others not? And so uh, the, the determinants of, 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 of healthy populations. And so why are some peoples, I think it's sort of the way they mean it, healthy and others are not? And so what it eventually turned into as described by Keyes and Galay, who sort of wrote like the sort of like the main sort of um, call it a textbook on it is um, it's a research program that confronts the structural forces. So thinking like structural racism, for instance, that place individuals at risk that creates distributions of health and disease unequally across socially defined groups. So think like, like for instance, racial groups. So it's not committing to the idea that, that, um, that whiteness, for instance, is a biological category. It's a socially defined group but there are differences, there are distributions nonetheless. And focuses on embedding biological pathways within social interactions that develop across the life course, you know, from, from, uh, from in utero through, through death and into the next generation and across generations. So this is sort of like the, the theoretical orientation to it. And the thing that's really, um, that sets it apart, or one of the things that sets it apart is I would argue would be, there's a rooting in, uh, what's uh, what uh, has in, in one context at least been called the fallacy of health inequity fatalism, and the way that Rose put it in in his 1992 book that became very influential is that there is no known biological reason why every population should not be as healthy as the best. So, like I was saying at the beginning, there are sometimes you're just dealt with, dealt a bad hand by genetics. Um, so there will always be healthier individuals and sicker individuals. If you're born with a heart defect or a mutation that causes genetic disease, I wrote my dissertation on genetic diseases, um, then you're going to be a disadvantage. And we can gradually try to make progress on counteracting those, but you, you were dealt a tough hand. And so we are, we are far away from, from a world in which um, 
in which we can sort of undo all of those kinds of things that you sort of, we can sort of level that playing field. But the, the thing that's radical here is this claim that, well, every population is going to have a mix of some people who are dealt a good hand, some people who are dealt a bad hand. Some people were born with, with, uh, with congenital heart defect and some weren't. Some were born with genetic diseases and, and, and most were not. And so it might, always, it might be the case that we'll always have sick individuals, but it's not, it doesn't need to be the case that there are sick zip codes, sick neighborhoods, sicker countries, sicker income brackets. It doesn't need to be the case that that's, that, that that's, uh, that that's going to happen. And so, so thinking back to that gradient of your, your, your percentile of income, you know, the 40th percentile of income doesn't have to die sooner than the, than the 55th percentile or even the 41st, because each of those populations has, has you know, people with a varying level of good luck in some terms. Um, and so, so, the, so, the, so, so Rose is making a, a sort of like a biological claim about the state of empirical evidence and it's held up over time. But what it really is functioning as is sort of like an ethical provocation is, is okay, but if there are these differences between, between neighborhoods, like that map I showed of, of the surrounding the University of Virginia, well, that's the result of political choices, broadly political choices um, that, 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 that we, don't, we didn't have to do them that way, nor do we have to continue doing them. And so, so this idea that it's that it's a it's a fallacy of, of a sort of fatalism that like well it ha that you have to have sicker populations like no you don't. Um, uh, so I'm I'm borrowing that terminology from um, from the group called uh, Public Health Liberation. They just have a new report that came out um, earlier this week, actually, sort of like giving that terminology, and I like it. So um, so with that background set up. Um, Here's what I sort of brought to the table when I was sort of looking at this stuff. So I wrote a book, um, as was mentioned in the beginning, called Philosophy of Population Health, because I was really interested in like, what's going on with this sort of ideology of population health? What are they doing that's, that's different or interesting from what other people had, have been doing before or are doing now? Um, and so I, I was sort of looking at it and I was like, well, you know, I think, they, I think this, this sort of this approach to, to health is I don't have any better ideas. Um, I think this is a, about right. I think we should be starting from these kinds of presumptions. I think we should start with this this this, this rejection of this of the assumption of that fatalism. I think we should be taking this approach of thinking about health over the life course. And so I, I sort of redefine what what health should mean across the life course. So I I made a bunch of sort of like little tweaks and elaborations and things like that. Um, but what but what I end the book with, which I sort of wish in hindsight I spent more time doing, and I've, I've written a little bit about this afterwards, is I make the claim that that really at the root of all of this is humility. That if it, that that it is both descriptively the case. So uh, so it is the case that 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 you know, that a pra that practices of being humble are key for this for this field as a whole. About this approach to doing population health, that sort of takes into account all these different disciplinary approaches to thinking about how to how to make health better, thinking about all the different mechanisms of of, of healthier populations and things like that, and is also ethically and ethically the case that I think we really need to keep being humble in these same kinds of ways. Otherwise this whole, this whole house of cards is going to fall apart. So I'll say what I, I'll say what that means now and about what, about how this all ties to interdisciplinarity. So I, I argue again, at the end of the book, it's sort of like the, the sort of the, the concluding lessons is that we need three kinds of humility to create a cohesive and equitable culture of health. So the basic idea is that health is too big a thing. It is too complicated. It is too multifaceted for any one person, for any one discipline, or any one sector of society. So think like government, academia, that kind of thing, to fully understand. There is no privileged perspective on health that is superior to all others. Um, I don't think there's any grounding for any kind of claim that that like one discipline is, shall rule them all. Um, and so we need to act humbly toward other sectors of society that, for instance, um, that academia, healthcare, industry, agriculture, government, all sorts of other sectors need to be brought in as partners rather than subordinates if we're going to try to make, make health better. Um, we need to act humbly towards other disciplines since it's going to take many different methods and knowledge traditions to understand and to advance health. So this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So, so take something like intersectoral humility. Um, so this is humility about all the different different sort of sectors of society that need to sort of come together, this, this idea of health across society that it's going to take to, to promote health. Um, so one example I've been, I've been writing about recently is, um, is mass incarceration. 
And so in the United States, we've tended to have sort of like very sort of bracketed and sort of siloed conversations about how to think about um, things like policing. And so policing, incarceration, it's pretty well known by this point that there are very, very large um, racist health, dis- health ra- racist outcome disparities in terms of incarceration rates between Black Americans and white Americans, treatment by the police. Like these are things that like should not be too, you, you kind of have to bury your head in the sand to sort of like to say like, no, 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 these, these things don't exist. These aren't problems. But the problem is that we, we sort of have these conversations in the realm of, 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 of justice reform. Of, of, of criminal law reform and, and policing reform. And what has sort of been much, much slower to, ha- to sort of percolate is that having these be also conversations about health. Because, and this is uh, from a report from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, there are massive health impacts from, from mass incarceration. And so we have a system by which we incarcerate enormous numbers of people and finally, people uh, people in population health are saying like, well, we really need to look at this. This is this is like a, really a problem. And so these patterns of mass incarceration create racially biased burdens on communities where people get caught in a spiral of discriminatory police surveillance. And so certain neighborhoods get massive amounts of, of police of police attention and um, and harsher treatments. That leads to de- for de- disparate incarceration rates then a web of these mutually reinforcing uh, harms that happen even after a person's released from prison. So you have poverty, inability to get housing, poor mental and physical health, often the loss of voting rights, overall social powerlessness, and you sort of have this spiral of these things all negatively, negatively mutually reinforcing each other. And that's really terrible. But these are conversations that we're not really having in terms of health at all. And so, so this is obviously not only a health problem, but if we're going to actually have any real discussion about about how to how to deal with the, the negative impacts of police killing U.S. police killing civilians at massive rates, um, higher than than any other any other peer country, or us incarcerating more people than any other any other peer country, then we're t- we're going to be missing part of a conversation. And so we need to deal with this as a health problem among other kinds of problems. And so we need to recognize that we need to start deal. We need to start talking to to criminal justice reformers if we're going to, to create a healthier United States, for instance. Um, these graphs are obviously really messed up. Like, oh my God, oh my God. Moving on, I can talk about more of that later if you want. Um, so, so getting to the interdisciplinarity. So I, I like the idea that this, this sort of endeavor of population health and population health science or whatever you want to call it, I, I, I sort of work in this area and I, I'm sort of ambivalent about it uh, in terms of like what, what exactly it should be called, just population health something. Um, it's this idea that it, it has to be in, it inherently interdisciplinary. And so, so for instance, I'm, uh, I'll be co-chairing the, the upcoming conference um, this fall, which I encourage you to, to look, at, look into, uh, of the Interdisciplinary Association for Population Health Science. And so it is the Interdisciplinary Association for Population Health Science. This is the main population health group. And so um, it, it needs to really, really own this, this respect for qualitative data and quantitative data and ethnographic data, all sorts of different kinds of knowledge traditions. And it gets, because the kinds of problems we're faced with are really, really complicated. Um, and so take, for instance, um, this is a, a new article that came out like, what, a day or two ago? That, um, where it was, uh, this is a headline from, from Stat News, um, like a, the medical news site. And it's saying, experts fear US may, may default to annual COVID boosters without sufficient data. And so I look at that as like, okay, yeah, like I also want there to be a database decision to be made about like, who should get a booster every year? Does it need to be every year? What are the what are the benefits? What are the costs? All that kind of stuff. Like, okay, like, yeah, I'm 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 down with this idea that we should sort of like we should think about that. But then thinking, but then the the enormous challenge that we're left with is considering like the enormous range of expertise that we'll need to synthesize, or at least that we should be synthesizing, to come up with an answer to something like the question of how how often to recommend COVID vaccine boosters and and to whom should we recommend them. So, so among other things, you have um, you have T cell immuno- immunologists who felt like really left out in a lot of these conversations because we really need T cell data to know about the durability of immunity, and we it's it's not as easy to collect that data as some other data, and so we we sort of been going with the data we have, not the data we want, and so like 
we we really need to incorporate that T cell data about how how are these vaccines performing in like over time and how much will booster help, for instance. And epidemiologists have been have been ha having like a big role in this, but um, they they too want more data. They want to they want to be able to synthesize more of it. They sometimes have a hard time uh, um, sort of piecing apart the different variables that that you might uh, might not know. Know, for instance, the, there's a problem with um, when comparing the performance of different vaccines. We don't know if there are any sort of systematic sort of self-selection things where someone like how do we sort of factor in that someone might choose to have gotten the Johnson Johnson vaccine as opposed to the Moderna vaccine the first time around, and how do we sort of like incorporate that into thinking about like how well do these work? Um, meanwhile, health communicators have been super frustrated that we sort of that there's this habit in the United States that, including during the pandemic, we tend to design guidelines to follow the clinical data on efficacy. But we don't necessarily plan around the sort of known problems like confusion over getting like really shifting guidelines about these sort of mixed messages about what vaccines do and where and how you get them and things like that. And even uh, even going even more interdisciplinary philosophers like me, are, we sort of worry about who gets to decide what counts as good enough evidence. That is not an obvious, <laughs> not an obvious answer. Um, so the best advice I can muster here is sort of like a general advice is that we should try to be humble about each of us only having p uh, one piece of a larger puzzle. That nobody sort of has has the the has the blueprint for how to do the whole thing. We each only have that one piece of the puzzle. Maybe sometimes one people one person's big uh, piece is bigger than another, but it is it is always a mere piece of a, of a larger whole. So all of the so this this intersectoral humility, interdisciplinary humility, they're in some sense sort of like um, different instantiations of what's of what philosophers call epistemic humility. Which is basically humility. Uh, epistemic just means about about knowledge and evidence, and so being humble about about our, our abilities as knowers. So um, so I, I I borrow my sort of my particular concept of it from um, from Anita Ho, who's a population health scholar and also a, a, a feminist bioethicist. And um, the way she puts it is, epistemic humility is a disposition as well as a commitment. It arises out of professionals' knowledge, acknowledgement of the boundary of their expert domain, as well as their fallibility. It means a commitment to make realistic assessment of what one knows and does not know, and to restrict one's confidence and claims to knowledge only, in a, 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 only to what one actually knows about his or her specialized domain. In particular, it's a recognition that knowledge creation is an interdependent and collaborative activity. I'll come back to that in a moment. Both the um, she's working in the case of um, of like you know doctor patient kind of stuff. So both the healthcare provider and the patient are counting on each other in investigating a full picture of the patient's experience and determining the most appropriate management strategies. And so the, so the reason why I like to I want to sort of press on this, especially in the context of interdisciplinarity, is this idea that's a, that it is a recognition that humility is a recognition that knowledge creation is an interdependent and collaborative activity. And so. A lot of us in in school. I mean, I, I even went to I went to a math and science sort of like special magnet school, and even in that context, I I was really sort of um, I was sort of raised into this idea of of science as being a fundamentally an individual endeavor that sometimes you work with other people on, and that's that's sort of the wrong way of thinking about this kind of stuff. I hope I hope I I know it's sort of a mixed bag, but whether science education has improved since since when I was a, when I was in elementary school or whatever. This idea that it's an interdependent and collaborative activity that we need to work together to sort of to do this kind of stuff, and we need to get used to the idea of depending on others to sort of work together to get some knowledge out of, out of uh, at the end of the tunnel. And so, this is actually a, a bit controversial in sort of thinking about like how to think about humility, and I think it might be sort of worth sort of pressing on this a little bit. So, so this will get a little more philosophical just for a moment, and um, hopefully for uh, hopefully it'll sort of pay off. So. The worry is, and it's been it's been articulated by um, by folks like Jose Medina, who's a who's another philosopher. He worries that that um, that saying humility is a good thing is actually kind of dangerous. Because he's uh, so this idea that oh we should all be epistemically humble. He's like, well, that's something we should sort. You should sort of be humble in moderation, because if hum if humility is attentiveness to one's cognitive limitations and deficits. Then being too caught up in thinking about your limitations could be pathological, as he puts it, or detrimental to your confidence and character. And so we worry about this sort of thing. We're training like scientists or doctors that it's like we don't want we don't want a doctor just to fold as soon as a patient argues against the diagnosis or demands a different treatment. Like that would be bad. 
And so it's really important that we sort of get really clear on what, what it means to be a humble collaborator or a humble knower. And so if you're thinking only about the boundaries of, of, of your knowledge or expertise, then um, you, if, we, if you only think about your limitations and not your strengths, that could be a problem. <clears throat> and, so, and so the thing that I, where I disagree with him is he's thinking that humility is just about, about recognizing the, the boundaries of your knowledge and not thinking about uh, what, what's what basically only thinking about what's outside the walls of your knowledge, not thinking about what's inside the walls of your knowledge. And so, um, so I like, I like Ho's account better because she says that it's a recognition of your strengths as well as your weaknesses. And it's, and it's not only thinking about your own strengths, but it's also, it's also humility is also reflecting on the person I'm working with on this. What are their abilities? What are, what are their limitations and strengths? And so we need to sort of reflect on not only our own limitations and abilities, but also those and others. And so one of the, one of the ways this can play out is this, is this idea of, um, I think humility in some sense is a, is a way of thinking about it, sort of like sharing the lane. And so if we're going to get at big problems, we need to learn to share the lane. And so, and so uh, I, here's the example of just the police brutality is our lane too, according to doctors, thinking about racism as a public health crisis. Racism is not only a public health crisis, but it is a health crisis among other kinds of crises. So, so for instance, in my book, I defend the notion of calling um, a social problem like um, a social problem like gun violence or um, climate change. Um, I explicitly talk about both of those. Um, that those are, you know, they can be criminal justice problems, they can be economic problems, but they're they can be spiritual problems, but they're also health problems. Um, this is really controversial stuff. Um, I think it's really important uh, context that that a lot of this stuff about stay in your lane especially when it comes to when it comes to health and this is sort of bubbled back up during during um, um, COVID-19 and things like um, the CDC saying um, you can't evict people from their from their rental apartments because because it's too dangerous to sort of put people on the street during a pandemic and then there's like a big there's a big backlash saying like no 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 that's like overstepping the boundaries of what counts as, as a health issue housing isn't a public health issue that kind of stuff um, unfortunately the Supreme Court agreed with that position um, and so, so some of this actually started started coming out um, when the night the when the National Rifle Association um, started tweeting that doctors need to stay in their lane and stay out of gun control conversations. And then in reply, you had a bunch of doctors tweeting back with the hashtag "This is our lane" and then showing pictures of their gowns after after treating gunshot wounds. And so, um, so that that's the kind of stuff that's that's really at stake here when we're talking about like, how do we think about sharing the lane of, of like do we talk about and how do we talk about something like gun violence or racism or whatever, all these sort of social social equity issues as also health issues, and then who should be contributing to the health issues and health research, things like that. So um, also, uh, it's just because it's it's been sort of like um, a topic that's been sort of like coming out in conversation recently is people have been talking about solidarity. Um, I think it, it might be worth sort of just mentioning here that um, that there, there is a relationship between humility and solidarity, especially since solidarity and sort of how we how we sort of like form, we express solidarity by sort of being with other people. It's like, I'm with you in this fight against COVID-19, for instance. So, it's, so it comes up inside social justice conversations and equity conversations. And so I, I think it's, it's um, important to recognize that there, it, this too connects with humility. Um, and so, so inside the way I, I've, I've sort of, uh, I've written about this a little bit that, um, there is an ethical component to solidarity. So, like for instance, there's um, um, in the in the in the literature on, on on feminist approaches to to bioethics, there's this idea of like relational solidarity, which is this um, this idea of like I want to be with somebody else and I want to be attentive to the power to power and social and social sort of position relationships in, involved in that. And so, I want to support this social movement trying to fight for things like criminal justice reform. But I also want to be really attentive to the way that like I'm sort of plugging into the system and there, there are sort of power dynamics at, at play. And then, but there's also an empirical component to solidarity that I, I try to press on in, sort of, in my work sort of as someone who's like who's kind of like uh, enmeshed in this sort of population health context. And I think it's not really, um, it's not recognized enough. And so the way the, the, the it sometimes comes out inside population health literature, including the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, which was a, a WHO statement. Um, and so empirically is sort of the claim here, 
health is created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday life. This is sort of one of the sort of the, the tenets of, of population health is that that health happens in everyday life, period. Um, it happens where they where they le- learn, work, play, and love. Health is created, and this is again empirical, by creating by by caring for oneself and others, by being able to take decisions and have control over one's life circumstances. And by ensuring that the society one lives in creates conditions that allow the attainment of health by all its members. And so there's this ethical idea of solidarity that we, that we, we need to work together. We need to sort of be with each other and try to do things like reduce those between zip code disparities. And there's also an empirical component where whether or not we can sort of form these solidarity relationships, our health hinges on those. That if we are not taking care of each other, then it, it, it all falls apart. So we either work together or we're just not going to get anywhere, basically. Um, and so the way that some people try to cash this out, um, so like the Robert Wood, John- Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is um, the, the biggest sort of health-oriented um, uh, um, in a, uh, um, private funding agency in the United States, like they, they, they do health and they, pay, they put a lot of money into it. The National Academy of Medicine is, has sort of uh, has echoed this kind of language that we need a culture of health. And so... Um, it's, it's a very scary idea that we need to have all these different aspects of, of culture all sort of like intersecting towards or all sort of like working in collaboration to try to create healthier living conditions for everyone. So we need the biomedical data research. We need we need criminal justice reform. We need food system changes. We need housing reform, all this kind of stuff all at the same time. And that is very daunting and very scary. But each of us can sort of play, can can sort of plug in in a different place, and so I'll, I'll sort of uh, I'll say a couple words about that, then I'll then I'll stop uh, and we can uh, have some conversation. So the way that um so um, Kamara Jones, the one who, who came up with that um uh, t- that diagram about the different ways that racism can can um, can play a role in health, um she she also came up with this sort of uh, what, what she calls the cliff analogy, and so. There are lots of different stages of health and health outcomes that we can sort of look at and different places where each of us can play a role in, in, in sort of like the research world and thinking about, like, okay, like what's going on here? How do we understand it? And so if you think about the, about a, a, the process of a person standing near the edge of a cliff, falling off the cliff and getting hurt. And so you can look at these issues at the point of like risk. And so like, what is it? how close can you get to the edge before you fall off? How do we know that someone's getting getting too close to the edge? Can we warn them before they get, get too close to the edge? What do we do about that sort of that, that pivot point between they're fine, they're fine, they're fine. Oh, it's looking pretty precarious. And then something bad starts happening. We can work in the, in the, in the realm of prediction. And so what's going to happen to this person after they hit the ground? What kind of care do they need? How can we sort of allocate resources to them um, so that we can we can try to help them as efficient as effectively and efficiently as possible. We can contribute to the to the question of like what's it like to be hurt? What are the experiences of a person who is really really being there suffering? What is it like to be ill? How can we understand this understand this person and get, and give them the care and attention they deserve? And so that's another way we can sort of contribute to this. We can obviously work in the area of caregiving, and so like once they get once they get inside the ambulance. How do we treat them best? What, what do we do for them once they're in the ambulance? And so there are lots of different disciplinary, uh, disciplinary and interdisciplinary ways of contributing to how do we sort of give them the care they need? And there are also questions of, of equity itself. And so we can ask questions about differences in quality of care. Why do some people get into the nice ambulance and other people get into the ambulance that's not so good? Um, we have differences in access to care. And so, to, or even things like some people have uh, a a metaphorical fence that protects them from falling off the edge and other people they're always sort of living uh, they're always sort of uh, there's nothing sort of there's no net or fence to sort of protect them from falling off some people also have nets to sort of catch them on the way down the u.s is, uh, is sort of infamous in the international sphere for basically not having much of a social safety net to speak of we have very limited housing support and very limited food security support things like that like you are largely on your own in the united states if things go wrong and there are also differences in exposures and opportunities. And so some populations are always living near the edge, that you're always one, one negative thing, uh, one negative impact away from sort of like having everything sort of spiral out of control. And other people have lots of buffer to protect them. They have lots of room to roam around. And so in the, in the context of interdisciplinarity, 
there are lots of different ways each of us can sort of can can help. You can sort of study this stuff per se. You can sort of like be one of the ones like, I'm going to look at this equity kind of issues. We can also have an equity minded lens towards looking at things like caregiving or what it's like to be ill. And so we each have a role we can play. So there's a lot of work to be done. But the point is that we'll need humility to make the to make any headway on the big sort of rebuilding challenges to, to make a better world. And so we need to listen to more kinds of voices than we're maybe used to. That is very hard to sometimes have conversations with people who have very different uh, perspectives, whether it's a disciplinary perspective or just um, a different perspective because of the of the kind of life they've lived. Uh, we need to question our convictions about our knowledge. We need to we need to sort of think about like what are our strengths and limitations, and also the strengths and limitations of others. And most of all, we need to be collaborative in order to rebuild this kind of world because. Um, if knowledge really is a collaborative activity, and I really do believe that that science and all sorts of and, and, and applied science, it's a team sport. We need to start acting that way and not be so not be so obsessed with like who gets to control this kind of thing and who's going to be the who has the most important contr contribution to this project, that kind of stuff. We need to act with with some more humility. So I'll stop there and, and move to a conversation. And here are some very tiny references. John, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I mean, you really drove home the fact that health is just not an isolated thing. It's like so dimensional and there's so many different aspects to it. One of our uh, participants here loved the way that you differentiated between causes of cases and causes of incidents. Oh yeah, I love this stuff. Could, yeah, Jeffrey Rose is awesome. <laughs> so, how, tell us a little bit more about that. Why have you adopted that? What was your rationale for kind of like uh, stressing that? It sounds like it made a real impact. Yeah, it made an impact on me. Um, so, uh, I guess I can sort of partially explain this auto, um, autobiographically. So, I, um, I like a lot of people sort of work in sort of like philosophy and ethics and stuff like that of science and technology. I, I was sort of initially drawn to things like um, genetic testing and advanced genetic technologies and things like that. And I, I think those are, those are perfectly interesting and worthy endeavors. Um, but I felt like the kind of things I was interested in were essentially like, it sort of dawned on me one day, it's like, I'm sort of like, uh, I, I've been spending all my time looking at the technologies of the 1% or like the would-be technologies of the 1%. And I felt like it wasn't where the action is, is the way I was starting to think of it. And so I was thinking about, okay, like I'm doing things looking at like new novel technologies and the possibilities of gene therapy for, uh, for, for different health conditions and even something like sickle cell anemia, which is, uh, which is, uh, it's just a higher burden of disease on black Americans than white Americans, although it's not only black Americans and that's, that's a misconception. Um, and I was, I was sort of looking at that like, well, but the, the disparities between the health of black Americans and white Americans or, or between Hispanic Americans and other, and other populations or all these other different, different sort of disparities, those aren't because of genetics. And so I felt sort of like, like I was sort of not following my interests in some sense, because I got, I wanted to get at those disparities and there are these disparities between individual people. And sometimes they're there, they are sort of partially tracking the genetic things, but I felt like I was only looking at sort of like the rounding errors. Um, and I wasn't sort of going where the action is. And so like, why are, why, what are the causes of these disparities between populations? Why are the, where are, why are there these, these six zip codes and neighborhoods and countries, even like the United States. And so I, that, that's what sort of drew me in. It's like, okay, because it's, it's going to be just different stuff. It's going to be different kinds of causes. And so it's not that, not to say that the sickle cell anemia research isn't important. Like it really is. And then it's, and that it's not relevant to, to racial health equity, like yeah, we should be investing in that because that that is a problem, and it's it, it's uh, it predominantly impacts a, a a population that's been that's been marginalized by U.S. society, but that but that that's not going to that's not going to deal with most of the problem of the vast life life expectancy disparities and heart disease outcome ex, uh, disparities and cancer outcome disparities, things like that. I loved how you discussed humility and its importance for us to come together as a multidisciplinary science to be able to solve a lot of these problems and just basically hear each other out and take into account all of the different voices which contribute to this multidimensional health uh, notion that you described. 
I'm also keenly aware of the hubris which seems to exist in our business, where indeed <laughs> often a very small but very very loud minority of people who are not so humility, not so uh, humble and have that much humility. And in fact, it's kind of their way or the highway. And often that's what happens. I'm curious of that contrast and what that may mean to you, what it may mean in the philosophy of, you know, the population health sciences. Yeah, I, I um, that, that, that too frustrates me. It also happens within my field. Uh, philosophers are sort of known for being like exceptionally arrogant as a, as a whole. Um, no, or on average, uh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it can be rather infuriating. Um, but you, you see, you, you have your sort of similar kinds of complaints about like all sorts of different, different sort of like uh, disciplinary groups or whatever or of subsets course. thereof. Um, for me, it's been like it's obviously annoying and rude when someone does that kind of thing. When someone's when someone is hubristic or a bully or tries to run the show. It's it's sort of easy to sort of to go to the, the sort of the low hanging fruit just to say like well you shouldn't do that because it's sort of bad form or it's not good collaborative it's not a good collaborative activity to sort of to to do that kind of thing or insist that you that you be the PI for no particular reason that kind of stuff um, and like yes that is the case that like um, but I I sort of I have found it interesting for myself to sort of to try to lay out sort of like a a, a sort of like a, a an additional few layers of sort of like of rationale and sort of um, lowercase p philosophy about like not only is it sort of bad form to to be hubristic like that to be that uh, to be that 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 um, that kind of person, but that it's it's also fundamentally fundamentally counterproductive to anything inside the inside the study of health that it is impossible to get an understanding of health without sort of working together and to recognize them that there are sort of um, an infinite number of perspectives on this sort of like this multifaceted whole of what health is. And so it's not only that you, that you're sort of being rude, but that you're, that what you're doing is fundamentally in conflict with our ability to actually accomplish anything in this, in this area. And so, so you, you, not only are you, are you sort of being a jerk, you're also being, you're setting us up for failure. There's a, um, enormous opportunities here for people who are working in data science, artificial intelligence, as they are thinking about how to construct intelligent systems, which can help guide health making decisions about how to spread the wealth of health resources around. What are some things that you think they should know as they're thinking about that, that touch on population health uh, health equity and other forms of fairness, if you will. I mean, just based on the the things, I, I'm not an expert, particularly in AI and and and, and um, in intelligent systems and things like that. But I, I I know some of the literature on it, and you you see fairly sort of like more sophisticated or more more sort of technologically sophisticated versions of older problems. That when the group of people that are developing or testing a system have a certain perspective they're not necessarily going unless they make it a point to seek out other perspectives they might sort of build their biases into the system and so um, what counts as success or what kinds of inputs do we put into it and so whether it's uh, um, camera systems that aren't able to track faces that are t that that are that are darker than the people who developed them like that's that's something that's that's, that's happened there's even been satires about exactly that problem the cameras that can't recognize black faces um, or whether it's um, it's uh, sort of uh, this tendency to think that okay, well, my job as a as a data scientist is to just sort of to build the thing, or I'm a data engineer, and so I'm going to I'm going to build the thing, and it's it's someone else's job to deal with the problem of okay, but like who is it going to impact, and how is it going to impact them, and so that sort of hands off approach, like well, I'll, I'm just in my silo over here, and I make things, and if it's going to be used by a health insurance company to to try to find people to to take away their their coverage, then that's that's their problem. Or if it's a, it's going to be used as a means for trying to do more sophisticated policing or something like that, that it's that's not my job or something like that. And so, recognizing the interconnectedness of what we're doing and um, recognizing that there are going to be there are going to be disparate impacts on different populations when you create a new technology, 
and being a making it a point to try to find out like okay how is this going to negatively how is this going to impact people from different socioeconomic groups from different from different racial groups are are there are there anticipatable sometimes there are unanticipatable ones but are there anticipatable problems that we should be looking for now Don, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation for this fantastic discussion. We so appreciate it. Uh, this has been really an education. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. And uh, for those of our participants, we will see you all next week. Thanks again, Sean. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, feel free to con contact me. I'm, I'm easy to find um, at the Center for Bioethics and Social Justice in Michigan State.